Dodonayal, you Maruin Kusodua, Bramishka Martida, Bramishka Martida Wahan, Manto Kuare Sedona, Chief John Harrington, or Malahua Metro Transit Police, Wahan Kawaran Sedona, Trenko Osup, a Luso Kurdi, or Maridona, Suharidona, Minneapolis, you St. Paul, Trenka Suho de Maridona, or Dada University. A sago or Arimahas, you Arimakale, or Farabadan. أنا كوري سنة هنا كوري سيجو حوداي سيدتنا. Chief John Harrington, welcome to Mogadishu Times. Uh, first, the uh, uh, first question I want to ask you is, I talked to one of your officers, and he told me that you are a Mogadishu fan. Is that is that true? I, I am absolutely a Mogadishu Times fan. So I have lots of lots of my constituents get their news from the Mogadishu Times, and I am very happy that we are involved with the with this publication and with this and with this website. Uh, it is a great vehicle for getting our message out and for getting information about what's going on in the community. We are delighted to hear that. Extremely delighted. <laughs> you are one of the prominent African leaders in the state. I I'm told that I, I think. That's uh, more praise than I'm probably deserving. So, but many in the Somali American community don't know you. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, the positions that you held, I know that you uh, held a high-profile uh, positions, and uh, could you please uh, explain who is Chief uh, John Harrington? And what position is that you held before? I'm going to make this very brief, though, I will tell you. Okay. Uh, I'm, as you said, I'm, my name is John Harrington. I am a 37-year uh, a resident of the, the state of Minnesota, uh, and I am primarily known in the city of St. Paul, probably more so than I am in the city of Minneapolis and statewide. Uh, in 1977, I moved here from Chicago after going to college to start my career with the St. Paul Police Department. And over the next 35 years, I rose through the ranks, started as a patrol officer, made sergeant, uh, was a detective, made commander, ran the training unit, uh, eventually made senior commander and ran the Western District, which is where I probably had my, my most significant um, encounters and, and, and began my friendship with the Somali community uh, because we had several mosques in my district and we had Skyline Towers, 1247 St. Anthony in my district. And so we regularly interacted with the Somali elders of, of St. Paul, uh, trying to get to understand what their needs were and what the, how we could interact with them more effectively. Uh, in 2004, I became the chief of police for the entire city of St. Paul, and we expanded that effort from simply working with the Skyline Towers community and the, the Altaqua Mosque and a few of the other mosques that were over on my side of town to working citywide with the Somali community. And once again, I, I probably got to know the community over in Battle Creek down on Lower Athlete McKnight um, better at that time because then we began to interact regularly with them. In 2010, I retired from the St. Paul Police Department uh, after finishing my term as chief. Uh, and in that same year, I ran for and was elected to uh, the Minnesota State Senate as a senator representing the East Side or Senate District 67, uh, which once again has a significant Somali community uh, population there. I stayed in the Senate for two years and left. Uh, I was not unhappy about leaving uh, because I had an opportunity to come back to what I really love, which was being a police officer. So that in 2012, in the fall, I joined the Metropolitan Transit Police as their uh, chief of police. And I've been serving quite happily as their chief of police uh, ever since. Um, I'm very active. I live on the east side of St. Paul. I still live in the city and still live in the same house I've been living in for years. I'm, uh, I'm a guy that's got seven kids, uh, four daughters and three sons. Uh, I am a, a graduate of Dartmouth College and the University of St. Thomas with a master's degree. I'm very active in my community. I chair a nonprofit called Ujama Place, which is a uh, community organization that serves African American men who have gotten into trouble with the law and are trying to find their way out. But I'm also active with the Boy Scouts running the Zulu District, uh, also active with Red Cross and Emergency Planning and the Minnesota Humanities Commission, uh, to say a few of the things that I'm involved with right now. That's very impressive. Very impressive. When the Somali community if they hear like a transit police, uh, they always think a transit police as a transit uh, security. Yes. 
I've heard like, that before. More like uh, a trusted security, but that's not the case. No, that absolutely is not the case. Could you please explain the, uh, what the transit police does and the difference between the transit, uh, Metro Transit Police and, uh, uh, and Minneapolis Police or St. Paul Police? Absolutely. 20 years ago, there was no transit police. There was, uh, there was a bus company that worked through the Twin Cities, and there were part-time officers who worked for that company. And in 1987, the Minnesota State, uh, yes, the Minnesota State Legislature passed a law that said that uh, they needed a transit police department, and they began the process of creating an actual police department, hiring sworn officers who have all the same arrest powers, the same powers to do search warrants, the same powers to issue tickets that any Minneapolis, St. Paul, or state police officer would have. Um, we started out fairly small, and we've been growing a lot in the last few years. Uh, we are separate from Minneapolis and St. Paul, which are governed by their jurisdictions, by the, the boundary lines that create the city of Minneapolis and the city of St. Paul. Uh, their officers have jurisdiction in those areas. My officers have jurisdiction in, in the eight-county metro area, which means that we have jurisdiction in over 90 cities. And the way our, the policing powers works is we have jurisdiction wherever there is a bus, an LRT line, light rail transit line, or a heavy rail like the North Star going out to Big Lake. So we are spread out all the way from Big Lake on the north down to Rosemont and all the way from the Wisconsin border out past Plymouth. Uh, we are in an area that has well over three million people. Uh, and the department has grown as the, as the needs of those communities have also grown. We work with, and I think this is, this is an important point though, we work with Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, we recognize that they have the home jurisdiction and they are the primary law enforcement agencies for their cities. And we, we work with them in partnership so that we can help supplement, assist, uh, but our mission is very simply to, to keep the people that are on the bus, who are waiting for the bus, waiting for the train, to keep those people safe. That's our, that's our fundamental mandate that was given to us. And it's still, the, it's still the charge that we feel is the most important one we can do. Uh, the other question I have is, uh, so far there has been 10 fatalities uh, involved in the, uh, the light rail. Yes, the blue line. The blue line. Over the course of the 10 years that it's over, been operating, over so the, it's yeah. over, over, a, over a decade of operation. Yes, the, uh, the 10 fatalities, two of them, I heard, were uh, Somali Americans. And that I do not know. That's, uh, two Americans, that's really high, uh, uh, compared to uh, the number of Somalis that live here. I would agree. Well, any, any, any death uh, that... It, is, is, a, is, is, is a tragedy for the community and for those family members that, that lose someone, whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, you know, a Somali-American or anybody else. It's, you know, so we recognize that you know, any fatality is, is a major incident that we take very, very seriously. The green line, uh, it's not, it's not, it's not going to be the same as the blue line because the blue line uh, goes through a, mostly an industrial area. That's correct. But the, the new green line, you know, it goes through a residential area like University Street yes. and all that. And we have two uh, large mosques with a lot of kids. Uh, could you please talk about the safety? Well, and we're, very, we're also very concerned about the safety of folks that live and work and travel along University Avenue, Washington Avenue, and the Green Line is going to be a, a new kind of challenge, and because of that, we've asked for additional resources uh, to help meet that challenge. Uh, the most important thing that I can say about what we're doing about that is that we're doing education to try and educate the children and the seniors especially, and those are the two groups I think are the are I'm most concerned about. I think. Um, the, the kids who run across the street, who have been able to run across the street before, even with traffic, mm -hmm. uh, that is one of my big fears, that they are, have for years been able to not have to look necessarily, thinking that a car will be able to stop for them if they run out on the street. And the trains, because they're much heavier, they, they're traveling at pretty good speeds, there just is not that margin of error. If, 
if they run out in front of a train. And, and, and if that happens, that will be a tragedy that we'll all, all be you know, incredibly disturbed by. I, my other group that I'm very concerned about is the elderly Somali community uh, at Skyline Towers and, 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 up, and where the mosques are, because with hearing problems and vision problems in some cases, we are also very concerned about them walking out and not being aware of their surroundings as, as the elderly sometimes are. Uh, and I, as I said, I think the, the Im most important thing we can do at, during these months that, that ramp up to the start of the Green Line, and the Green Line won't actually start actually operating until June 14th. That is the actual launch date for the, the Green Line, which is the line that runs from the University of Minnesota, uh, from Target Field really in Minneapolis, through the University of Minnesota to University Avenue in St. Paul, and will run all the way down through downtown St. Paul to the Union Depot. Uh, we are doing a, a mass education process uh, throughout these next few months. And we've actually been engaged in that education process for quite a while. We've been doing community meetings, we've been doing community outreach, uh, we've been sending out emails, we're, we've got flyers uh, printed in a multitude of languages because we know that our best chance of making the Green Line safe is if all of the folks that are going to be walking and riding and traveling up and down University Avenue if they're well educated about the hazards of the train. And, and the word we are using to, that we think the most important thing that we can tell everyone along University Avenue is to look. So if the, everyone looks, we'll be much safer. So, so the uh, people who reside uh, in these areas, they already know the danger that, that you know, we have already, with, uh, we have already started line. sending out flyers, we've already started having community meetings, but we're going to continue that process uh, throughout, right up until the day that the line starts, and then we're going to continue that education process because, frankly, every time someone new moves to cities, every time somebody moves from a different part of town and suddenly comes on to University Avenue, they may not have lived in the neighborhood, but they will certainly be somebody we're going to want to reach. And so we're doing a lot of stuff over the internet, mm -hmm. we're putting out a lot of stuff on radio and TV, we have flyers, we have uh, bus shelter cards, so we're doing, we're using kind of as many different modes of communication as we can to try and get this message out and in fact uh, my police department is engaged right now with a process of literally handing out flyers to people up and down University Avenue mm -hmm. trying to make sure that folks who maybe don't use the internet, I think there's not very many of them left, uh, or who aren't, haven't read the paper or aren't watching TV, um, we want to make sure that they get this message. In fact, this visit with you is, is part of what I hope is going to be a, a, a big community outreach to the Somali community to make sure that they get this information and that we can have a safe, not just a safe launch, mm -hmm. but a safe uh, process with this, with this new green line as it starts to operate in, in St. Paul. Uh, because it's a new, new. It's going to be a new challenge for many of us. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, uh, what is the difference between the green line and the blue line? There isn't really significant difference. The cars will be the same. The fares will be the same. Um, so the, the difference is only the route. The route is different. The only other difference, mm -hmm. and, and there is a, there, the one difference that I would say is is where the two lines are, and you pointed that out already. Mm -hmm. The blue line, which runs from Target Field down to the Mall of America, down through the airport, is mostly running through an industrial area. So that there are, that's less heavily residential. And where it is residential, the houses are not as close to the line as they are on University Avenue, where we have Skyline Towers, we have the U University of Minnesota that has dormitories there, where quite literally, you can walk across the street and be at your house, mm -hmm. uh, and the train will be running just that close to you. So that is, a, that is the one significant difference, is, is how close the train will be to residential property. But this is something the engineers, uh, a, safe, uh, a safe place both for pedestrians and for the riders. Uh, since you became uh, uh, the chief, I was told that you hired more minorities than any chief. Uh, how do you feel that? Uh, well, that was a mission of mine. I, when I came to the police department, I did not feel that the police department was, uh, had the diversity that it needed. I come from, a, 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 my, one of my chiefs was a, 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 a gentleman named William Finney. 
and William Finney coined this phrase, a police department can only be effective if it is both reflective of the community that it serves and responsive to the community it serves. And in my mind, when I got to Metro Transit, the department was not reflective of the diversity of the community it served. We had one Somali officer at the time. Uh, we had less than a handful of African-American officers. We had very few Asian officers, no Hmong officers at the time that were working there. And I felt it was important for my agency to reflect the the, the fabric of what Minneapolis-St. Paul brings to us. And so I made it a point to uh, recruit heavily in the Somali community and we were fortunate to get two Somali officers and then have a Somali civilian employee come on. Uh, we were fortunate enough that, uh, that Sergeant, now Sergeant uh, Wahid Sarak was, uh, he turned, came up number one on the sergeant's list and so I was able to promote him. And as I understand it, he is the first Somali sergeant in the United States. Um, we have been able to hire our first Hmong full-time officer. We've hired uh, Latino women and Native American men, and we are endeavoring to make uh, Bill Finney's vision of what a good police department looks like. Uh, we're endeavoring to make sure that our department is really reflective of the community that we serve, and that means it can't just be any one group. It has to be a mosaic of all the different parts of our community, and. Uh, the Somali community is a is a rich has a rich tradition of public service, and I felt it was it, it made no sense not to have them you know, very readily represented. Uh, um, I've been blessed because one of the unique pieces about my department is that I have not just a full time cadre of officers, but I also have a part time group of officers, and so. Um, in addition to the three full-time sworn officers, we are in the process of hiring another two or three Somali officers who serve in Minneapolis, St. Paul, or other departments so that we will actually have access to six off, about six Somali officers within this sum, by this summer. Um, and that won't be enough, but it will give me a good start because what I hope for, and this has been my experience so far, and Sergeant uh, Sarak is certainly an example of this, if everybody went back and just helped another brother from their community come forward, mm -hmm. uh, help them get through school, help them realize what their dream would be, our department would be, be the ideal, it would be the envy of every police department in the, in the state of Minnesota. And I have people that have that kind of good heart. Um, they understand that their job is to serve the public, and that to do that, they have to reach out to the community and that they can't be sitting in their squad car waiting for the community to come to them. It's their job to reach out to the community. So I believe that you're gonna see our department continue to grow, uh, both in size, but also you're gonna see it continue to grow in diversity. Chief, uh, could you tell us more about uh, the event that is gonna take place very soon in St. Paul? Well, uh, one, of, one of my beliefs, is, in, as I said, I, I, I cut my teeth on you know, believing that police departments have to be both reflective of the community, but we also have to be responsive to the community. And the only way a police department can be responsive to their community is that they, if they're engaged in a dialogue. They have to be talking to the community because I don't know what the community needs if I'm not having that kind of conversation. And so one of the tasks I asked Sergeant Sarach to do was to set up community meetings with the Somali community. Uh, and the first one of those is coming up next Tuesday, I believe. Um, in the evening at 1247 St. Anthony Skyline Towers, uh, and we're going to meet from 5.30 to 6.30, and it, 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 is, it, it really holds, I'm hoping to get two things done. One, I want to help uh, get more of the message out about safety on the Green Line. That is definitely part and parcel of this. But I also want the community to know that the Metro Transit Police are here to serve them, uh, that, that we stand with our, our partners in St. Paul and Minneapolis to serve the Somali community uh, and all communities, whether they are in Minneapolis, St. Paul, or anywhere in the, in the eight county metro area, uh, that we are ready to serve them, uh, that, we are, that we want to serve them, and that uh, the best way that we can do that is if they tell us what their needs are, whether it is responding to thefts, which we know happens on occasion where women's purses have been stolen, or if we're dealing with assaults or we're dealing with rowdy behavior. We want people to have a safe and peaceful experience when they're waiting for the train or waiting for the bus. And we believe that if they tell us where the issues are, I can make sure that there are officers out there to keep the peace. Chief Sergeant Siraj was 2009. He was the officer of the year. Yes. Could you tell us more about this officer? 
He was officer of the year. He is probably, and most folks in the department will tell you this, he has probably got the greatest gift for remembering faces of anybody that I've seen in policing in 30 years. Uh, he sees somebody, he sees a picture of somebody, he encounters them on the streets, and it's like he has a memory bank of all of these faces that he never seems to forget. As a consequence, as a detective, which is what his assignment is now, mm -hmm. he's invaluable. Uh, we get, because we have 6,000 cameras on the, on the trains and buses, if someone commits a crime on transit, we almost always have a picture of them. And, and we're blessed to have Sergeant Siraj because he recognizes those faces, can put them into a context of where they, where they're from, who they, how who they associate with. Uh, so he has been a, a tremendous asset. Uh, this last few weeks, he in fact has been running the the detective division while the lieutenant's been out. He was entrusted with being the acting commander of the detective division uh, while the lieutenant was out of town. Uh, and he has it just a he has nothing but an upward trajectory for his career. Uh, he can go as high in this business as he ever wants to. I would, I would say the other thing that I'm very proud of him, every new sergeant, I ask them to take on a special project. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, the special project I asked him to take on was the issue around human trafficking. Um, he, he took on that project. It's not an easy project. Uh, you're working with social service agencies, you're working with multiple law enforcement jurisdictions, the feds, Minneapolis, St. Paul, the state. He took on that project and became a major player in the human trafficking effort of reducing, especially sex trafficking in the, in the Twin Cities area. He has created training, he has created advertising, he's created a network of associates, he's gotten us involved with, uh, as I said, all these other agencies, uh, and he is going to, this project that he's going to work on, is going to save young women's lives, quite literally. So I am incredibly proud of the work he's done in his, in, in, he is just in his first year, and as I said, he, the sky is the limit for him. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. Thank you.